stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt, and we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited, 60 minutes of nonstop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Jerry and hi everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about Access Television Series. I'm Samantha Bentley and this is the 1022nd edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Today we're taking you to the 25th annual Chevy Vet Fest Car Show. As our regular viewers know, this show has been held at McCormick Place on Chicago's lakefront for the past couple of decades. This year it has a new home in Rosemont, Illinois at the Donald E. Stevens Convention Center. We're going to chat with the show manager, Bob Ashton, later in the program to find out how the change is working out. Right now, we'd better get busy with the cars because there were hundreds on hand. Let's start with a surprise Yanko. We are going to start off this very uh, special edition of Chevy Vet Fest uh, with some really interesting information about the Yankos. Now, anybody that's been watching the Barrett Jackson auctions uh, over the past couple of years knows that the Yanko Camaros, and for that matter, Chevelles, and all the rest of the Yankos bring ungodly amounts of money. The, uh, it, the typically the Yanko Camaros, as an example, will start at a million dollars. Am I correct? Well, not quite that, but close. But but very very close. Very very expensive cars. We're going to tell you something very interesting about uh, Yanko, and it's actually his name was Don Yanko. We're going to tell you something very interesting about him in a minute, but first of all, you are. I'm Ed Kanine. And where are you from? Uh, Lombard, Illinois. All right. Janine, I want you to pull your camera shot back a little bit right now, and here's the surprise. What most people don't know is that the very first Yanko was a Corvair. That's right. Tell yeah. us about it. What have we got here? Don Yanko ordered 100 of these cars back in December 1965 in order to qualify as a manufacturer for SCCA production racing. And this, this is the first one that he built. So Don Yanko's first interest really was road racing. Yeah, absolutely. It was always road racing. And they were called the Yanko Stingers. That's correct. And as I understand it, the one that I'm standing next to uh, was the very first Yanko ever car number one. That's right. This is the first one he ever produced with his new uh, uh, Yanko sports car dealership. And behind it, as I understand it, is the last one produced. That's right. It's a 1969 Yanko Stinger, one of only one built that year. What was special about the Yanko Stingers as opposed to normal Corvairs? Well, uh, a normal Corvair could not race in SCCA racing because it wasn't a sports car. So what Yanko had to do, similar to what Carroll Shelby did the year before, was order 100 cars to make them a manufacturer, take out the back seat to make them sports cars, and that uh, made them eligible to be able to race in, in uh, production D racing. Now I'm reaching back in my memory banks a long way, but as I recall, he also had suspension modifications and engine modifications, or am I incorrect? Oh no, there were different stages. There were stage one, two, and three engine modifications. This is a stage two car, but uh, the ones that actually raced in uh, D production were stage three, and they had all kinds of modifications. You know, the Camaros have become, I suppose we could say the Yanko Camaros are far and away the most valuable of all of the Yanko cars, but has the value of the uh, Stingers gone up? Oh, absolutely. I was very fortunate uh, to have purchased a couple of these uh, years ago because they've really escalated in value also. Okay, Con contrast it with a Camaro, a, 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 a documented uh, Yanko Camaro, let's say is a, I don't know, $750,000, $800,000 car. Where would a Yanko fall, a, a Stinger fall in? Well, actually, you know, the, the ZL1 Camaros are really are pulling the $800 million mark. The Yanko Camaros are probably in the three hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 mark. Uh, these cars here are, are well under $100,000. Okay, so they still haven't yet achieved the value of the Camaros because I would think, as history moves on, being that these were Yanko's first efforts, that eventually they would overtake the Camaros, I would think. Well, I don't know if they'll ever overtake them because the Camaro is such a popular model to begin with, but as a historian, I've seen what uh, type of work Yanko did with these, and he actually uh, dirtied his hands on these cars and not just put stripes on them and actually worked on them, and, and that was his passion. 
Absolutely, and just to remind our audience, by the way, the uh, Yanko Camaros, uh, very much like some of the, like, uh, for example, the Nikki cars and uh, Baldwin for that matter, and for those of us who were Pontiac fans, Royal Pontiac and all that, what these were were very aggressive dealers uh, that made all kinds of modifications to the car and put their own badges on it. In the case of Yanko, he had the Yanko uh, badge on everything. And now, who would have thought, looking back then, who would have thought that those cars would be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the work those aggressive dealers did? Yeah, it's incredible. And you know what? The striping packages have done a lot for Yanko to bring it along because they were good-looking vehicles. Yeah, and it made them very identifiable that, you know, let's face it, when a person spends a lot of money, you'd like to have somebody look at it and say, oh, that's a... You're right. You know, that's a Yanko. That's a Yanko, and it, and it has that look because a lot of the, uh, like the Nikki cars are very difficult to identify as Nikki cars. Absolutely. And one interesting fact about these 100 cars that were built in 66 is the color scheme. They were built white with blue stripes because that was a United States color for international racing. And that's what the requirement was to race back then. Well, that's correct, of course. And again, Don Yanko, being a road race fan, he would have known that, that uh, those were the American, inter like red is uh, Italian and right. uh, French racing blue, and right. uh, the Americans were the, uh, were the blue and white colors. That's right. Okay, anything I haven't uh, uh, mentioned or noticed about your Stingers that I should have that you think the audience should know? Well, uh, they built 100 in 1966, and then in 1967, uh, Don had planned to build over 500 of them, but the introduction of the 67 Camaro kind of uh, hurt those plans a little bit. They ended up building only 14 uh, Stingers in 1967, one in 1968, and one in 1969. And all together, the total were, was? Well, 116. All together, 116, and how many are left? Do we know? We know that there's 50 uh, 1966s left, and there's eight 1967s. No 68s are left, and only the one 1969 that's right behind me. And you happen to own the first and last one. No, I own the first, the 1966, and Bob Dunahue owns the. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought they were both yours. Okay. No, but I own the first 1967 Stinger also built, but that's not here today. Uh, so you have more than one? Yes, I do. Pretty cool. Anyhow, we are just getting sh started here today at Chevy Vest at the brand new venue. We're at the uh, Rosemont Convention Center, and I can tell you, folks, it's packed here. So apparently the change in location uh, didn't hurt a bet, and I'm absolutely delighted about it. There's an interesting piece of history. The first Yankos were Corvairs. Hi, I'm Patty Borowitz. Now, Samantha mentioned in the opening that we were going to be chatting with show manager Bob Ashton to see how relocating the fall edition of Chevy Vet Fest is working out. Let's do it now. I am here who, with a guy that has got to be the most nervous guy in the world because after about 20 years of Chevy Vet Fest at McCormick Place, uh, it changed ownership and one of the first things is it also changed location and I am pleased to say, as I said in the last piece, it really looks like the place is packed. So oh. apparently it worked. First, tell the folks who you are. My name is Bob Ashton. I'm the show manager from Championship Auto Shows. We, we are overwhelmed. It's just everything has gone fantastic. We've got the, we've got cars from 17 states here. We've got the largest Triple Crown gallery the show's ever seen with 48 Triple Crown contenders. Explain to the audience what Triple Crown means. Triple Crown is our award that we uh, we offer for the gentlemen who and ladies in this case that have already achieved Bloomington Gold status and have achieved. Uh, or have, have earned an NCRS top flight. So these are the best of the best of the restored Corvettes. Okay, so in other words, they would have to win uh, Bloomington Gold, uh, NCRS, and Chevy Vet Fest? That's right, they have to be a gold spinner winner also. So, so this that is would the be third. the triple crown? That's correct, yep. And it's a very, very tough award to get. I mean, these are truly the best of the best. Okay, as I identified earlier, we are in fact in uh, Rosemont, Illinois at the uh, Rosemont Convention Center, a huge brand new facility. Yeah. And after years and years at uh, McCormick Place, now I would presume that the spring Chevy Vet Fest will still be at McCormick Place or no? Or we well, don't know? That, that is correct. March 3rd and 4th are the dates for that show. We will be at McCormick North again, but I'm happy to announce November 2007. We'll be right back here. Okay, is there a reason to uh, come out to Rosemont? Well, the facility here is just, it seems to be tailor-made for what we do. Um, we do have a little bit more room to work with, so which we need. Works much better with the oh. shop, with the swap meet too. Everything about it. The access points, entry and exit is quite a bit easier to work with. Um, and it seems like the convenience to the O'Hare Airport has worked out real good, because I 
keep getting stopped by people that are from Houston or came in from California. So it seems like the convenience factor with the airport is bringing in a lot of people that have wanted to come to VetFest. And just because they can take a quick cab ride over, they say, let's do it. Right. Of course, we are only a few minutes from O'Hare right. Airport here. Now, let's get down to business here, folks. You know that all year long, I tell folks that all summer, we have car show after car show after car show, two or three car shows a weekend in most cases during the summer. But in the winter, there are only three. Yep. There's Chevy VetFest. The fall Chevy VetFest opens the winter car show season. World of Wheels smack in the middle of it. And then Chevy VetFest Spring closes the winter car show season. Right. So the only three shows you have are the three, the Chevy, the two Chevy VetFest and the World of Wheels. So you shouldn't miss any of them. And if you're not at this one today, although it seems like everybody is here, yeah. but if you're not at this one today, you missed it and you missed one third of the winter car shows, right? That's correct. And, and the neat thing about it is if you want to come back and see me, I co-manage the World of Wheels show in mid-January at McCormick, and as you know, I manage the two Corvette we should, Chevy VetFest show. We should, we should say that. The things have changed because it was Al Ferkey and Ken Hanna that created the Chevy VetFest shows that ran them for in excess of 20, 20 years. 25 years, and this is a 25th anniversary show Is it really? Here. So Ken and Al did a wonderful job setting the foundation for this show, and you know we have nothing but great things to say about what they've done. They created the Triple Crown Award. And uh, we just took the momentum that they had and, and just want to take it to the next step. Well, I couldn't have been more pleased when I understood that, uh, that it was going to change hands. I, and, and then I heard it was going to be the World of Wheels people that were going to take it. I couldn't have been more pleased because you guys have a ton of experience in the Chicago area. You're familiar with the importance of these shows. Right. Uh, the Chevy Vespa shows have become icons here, literally icons. And yeah. you guys apparently you intend to keep them going. Oh, and, boy, do we. And, and, to infinity? Is that the right way to say it? That's the plan. Our company started in 1959. A little funny side note, we were actually the first public show to take place in McCormick Place with our World of Wheels show in 1962. Is that right? That's correct, yep. Well, listen, uh, we've got a ton of cars to look at here today. Is there anything else you want to tell the folks before we get going? You I, already gave the date for next year. Right. Do it one more time. for right. If you're seeing this show, uh, it, well... Some people are going to see it in 2008, too. So. Well, we're <laughs> going to be here in 2008 also, but, but for, we're at March 3rd and 4th are the dates. We'll be at McCormick North. Now, that's for Chevy Vet Fest For Chevy Spring. Vet Fest, right. World of Wheels at, um, at the McCormick Place also. You have the date on that? And that would be January 28th through 30th. We're talking about 2007. 2007. And, and next fall? Same weekend we're here, which is the weekend between Thanksgiving and the SEMA show. So week before Thanksgiving, 2008. All right, folks, as I said, there's only three car shows. If you want to get your car show fixed, there's only three choices in the wintertime. Chevy VetFest opens the winter car show season in the Chicagoland area. World of Wheels smack in the middle of it. And, of course, Chevy VetFest Spring closes the winter car show season. You don't really want to miss any of them. Boy, that's the truth. Once my husband, Art, and I missed one, and it was a long haul until the next show came around. Hi, I'm Janine Lauschott, reminding you car shows aren't just about cars. They're about seeing your friends and making new ones. On the other hand, if the very special cars weren't there, we wouldn't be gathering. Speaking of special cars, how about this exquisite pair all the way from the northeast part of the country? Boy, have we got a pair for you. Very difficult uh, challenge on television because they're both black. And as I've explained on Motorsports Unlimited before, I normally avoid uh, black and dark blue cars because on television, you know, all photography is about reflected light and black doesn't reflect the light. On the other hand, these are a couple of outstanding cars. and I just could not walk past them because we are talking about a pair of 435 horsepower tri-power Corvettes. And one of them is perfect for me. And we'll get to that in a moment. First of all, let's meet the folks, and you are? I'm Harry Snow. Where are you from, Harry? From New Hampshire. And you are? Chris Spanos. From? New Hampshire. Okay, New Hampshire. That's my old neck of the woods. I was born in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and lived a good part of my life in upstate New York in the Albany area. Do you know the area? Oh, yeah. Uh, do you guys have any snow up there yet? We've had a little bit. Have you really? Yep, two, yeah. three times. You know what I'm talking about. That's on the lee side of the Great Lakes, and you guys, that's the uh, snow belt. That's right. Okay, how do you keep such nice cars up there? Keep them in the garage. Yeah, I'll bet you do. First of all, let's start with the coupe down here, although I got to tell you, mine would be the Roadster because I love open cars, but it looks like uh, if you own your cars, it doesn't make a difference. You got one of each. That's right. Okay, let's start with the coupe. What have we got here? Yeah, it's a 67, 427, California car, what they call an AIR car. Um, it's, it's been showed, you know, probably half a dozen times. It's a Bloomington Gold, top flight, and then we're here to kind of finish things up with a triple crown. So you're going for the triple crown? Yes. Okay, and uh, I've already identified it. It's a big block 427, four-speed or automatic? It's a four-speed. 
right now. How about the Roaster? Is it also a four-speed? Yeah, the Roaster is a four-speed um, radio delete car, fairly rare. Triple black, two-top roadster, um, 427, 435 horse. Explain to the audience what a radio delete car, it's more important than it sounds. Well, basically, it, you know, it, it, they, didn't, they ordered it without a radio. Um, radios were heavy, so it eliminates uh, quite a few parts on the car. Um, it's pretty much a no-option car. You know, it would have been a quarter-mile car back in those days. Yes, and typical, typically what the manufacturers, they didn't want the general public to get these race cars, so they would offer them with packages like, you know, the all aluminum big block or something like that, and couldn't get it with a heater, couldn't get it with a radio, because they didn't want it falling into the hands of the general public. They wanted race guys to have them. Yep, and it and also saved a lot of weight. No. And, and saved, saved the weight of the vehicle. Now, did you restore the cars, or were this, they, this way when you got them? Uh, they, they were somewhat restored, and we did a lot of work to them over the years. I mean, we've had them for quite a while. Okay, so you are a car guy. You actually get in there and work on it yourself. Well, I, I let him do most of the. That's what I'm getting. Who actually work. who actually does the uh, sawing and hammering? Yeah, we've done a lot at my shop. Okay, you got a shop that does this? Yep, Chris okay. Spanis Auto. What is it? Chris Spanis Auto. Also in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay, and what brings you all the way here to uh, Chevy Vet Fest in Chicago? Well, we just want to come and experience the Triple Crown. We've okay. always spoke about doing this, and we never got to quite make it. So when we got these cars up to this rank, we figured this was time to come out and experience it. Okay, great. So this is your first time here? Yes. Well, are you enjoying it? Oh, I'm having a great time. Oh, good. That's great. Well, welcome to the Chicago area. Like I say, I, it, whenever I hear somebody from the East Coast, I have to tell them right away, I'm originally from that part of the country myself. And folks, if you don't know, I can tell you this. Some of the most beautiful country in the world uh, up there in the East Coast. Am I, am I correct? That's perfect. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gorgeous up there. And the only problem is my parents had a motel and restaurant and everything on the old Route 20. You know Route 20? Sure. I'm, and when the, highway, when the interstate highway went through, it wiped everybody out up there. But other than that, it's a great area to live. And Janine, once again, show the audience the two Corvettes. We've got a Roadster and we've got a Coupe. And both of them, 435 horsepower, tri-power, four-speed cars. I'll take the Roadster. Me too, Bill. I love open cars. Of course, in this climate, the coupe probably makes more sense, but are big black 427 tri-power four-speed Corvettes really about making sense? No, they're about fun. And speaking of fun, you can't have much more fun than you can have with an early vet. Let's check out a first-class example. We see this NCRS on a number of cars, particularly over here in the showcase section. And I should tell the audience that we are in a special section of Chevy VetFest called the showcase section. Uh, and this is where they have some very, very special cars displayed, uh, not the least of which is the one that you're looking at. But I am curious about this NCRS, which we see on so many of them. First of all, we've got the owner here, and you are? Jim Sandlin. And where are you from? From uh, Ortonville, Michigan. Is that in America? Yes. It's <laughs> That's Detroit. a joke. I'm teasing. I know. Uh, what is this NCRS? What is that? It stands for National Corvette Restore Society. Apparently a very big organization. Yes. Uh, I think they have around 50,000 people that are members. And as I understand it, the idea that most of the guys here seem to want is they want to get a Bloomington Gold, they want to get an SCRS, and they want to get a Chevy Vet Fest a Gold Spinner. Right. In fact, most of these cars in this area, they've been, they had to have a Gold at, uh, at a national event. They've had to have a Bloomington Gold. To qualify to be in this right. section. And matter of fact, Janine, if you would, broaden your shot full wide and just pan down a little bit to the right. You don't have to go too far. They've got about six six or seven rows here of cars. Uh, presumably all have qualified for the special showcase area. Right. Uh, in fact, this year, my car, I had. Uh, I went to San Antonio, got a top flight at the National. I took it to St. Charles, Illinois, and got the Bloomington Gold. And I'm here to get the Triple Crown which is uh, the three awards put together. So you want that triple crown? Yes, sir. Okay, tell us about your car. What have we got here? Start with the make, year, and model. Okay, you got a 1956 Chevrolet Corvette. Uh, it's the uh, first year that they kind of changed the body style from the original one that they came out in 53, 54, and 55. Uh, you'll see 56 and 57s here, the first four or five cars. It's uh, got a V8 under 265, 245 horsepower. That's right. It's the dual quad V8. Dual quad car. And, and a four-speed car. 
No, oh, three it's not, speed in 56. You know, I should say that. I, I thought it was a four speed, then I said, wait a minute, they didn't have a four speed till 57. Right, 57 is the first year of the four speed, and they changed over to 283 engine. So this is kind of a unique car. They had uh, 265 and 55 and late 55 and all of 56. Did the 56 have roll up windows? Uh, they have roll up windows, but also it had an option. Um, what they call a factory option for power windows, which is car head. This got power windows? Yes. Okay, because I'm trying to remember, it seemed to me the very earliest Corvettes did not have roll-up windows. No, and they, most of the it's typical of that era, when they came out with the cars, they got them out on the road, and then they added things on as the engineering became available. Oh, is that right? Right. Okay, did you specifically want a 56 or this is the one you came across? Well, I like 56 and 57 body style because they got the single headlights. I agree. And uh, I've had uh, 356s other than this one and I kind of like that, that style. Now, did you do any of the work on it or oh, was yeah. it this way when you got it? No, uh, I've done about half the work. Uh, I, I had two what they call basket cases, which are cars that are scattered in pieces and it got to be where I get a little later in my life so I didn't want to get it done so I bought this in about a half done and finished it up. I'll tell you something you did a great job now is there anything I haven't noticed about your car or your effort that you'd like the audience to know that I uh, haven't thought to uh, mention? Well the only thing is is that you'll find out that uh, all these cars are right down to the nuts and bolts where they got to have the correct markings and I everything mean, the, matching numbers, everything oh, correct. Numbers and even down to marks on the bold head. And history. And history, like the top, the black top. They only made 103 of those in 1956. Probably the most documented uh, vehicle that you'll find in the world, right here. You can, anything you want to know about it, you can find out. Well, listen, I want to thank you for spending a little bit of time with us. Janine, if you would, show the audience the car if you're not already doing so. This is an exquisite example of a dual-quad 56 Corvette. That's right. Bill said Janine. I was on camera that day. I hope you're enjoying my work. I love to do it. Now let's move on to one of the very important car club displays. Well, I know right away this is a lie, and if I understand it correctly, this is part of a car club called the Chicago Gearheads, and they are primarily Chicago policemen, if I understand it correctly, and they start right off with a lie saying 327. I know it is absolutely not true. We're going to find out a little bit about all this, but first of all, before I go on, I want to mention about the car club participation. Uh, all of these shows depend heavily on car club participation. They have special awards for the best car club displays and all of that sort of thing. Very, very important in putting a car show together is the uh, car club participation in the Chicago Gearheads. I think we see them at literally every show we go to. First of all, you are? Claudio. Uh, what's your last name? Bernardo. And where are you from? Chicago. Okay, and we're going to talk to you about your car in a minute, but I want to meet the rest of these guys. These are all club members? Yes. Okay, let me start all the way down here at this end, and you are? Rocky Sardo. From? Elmhurst, Illinois. And? Larry Watson from Chicago. Are you one of the gearheads? Yep. And you are? Smoking Woody. From? From Chicago. And? Phil Stoll from Chicago. And? Chris Walters from River Grove. Get in and, here, and? Rocco Sardo from Chicago. Okay, did I identify it correctly? Basically, Chicago policemen are part of the oh, gearheads? Yeah, some, uh, some, most some, of them? Some yeah, of them? Some, some of them? Okay. All right, we go back to the 327 thing then. A blatant lie. Are you a Chicago policeman? No. Okay, well, I guess you can get away with it then. Uh, <laughs> tell us about your car. What have we got here? It's a uh, 492. Uh, 65 yeah, 492. Chevelle. That's not 327. I know, but it adds a little flavor to it. People look it's at it. It's a lie. They don't know unless you open the hood. <laughs> That's my point. It's That's a lie. beautiful, though. That's the way it should be. I never kidding. give, give, never give, never show your hand. Okay, tell us about it. What do we got? It's a 1965 Malibu. Came out of Arizona. Um, obviously two door. It's a uh, 492 big block, 400 trans, uh, 373 12 bolt. You know, it's got nitrous on it, and uh, it's pretty much it. You run it at the drag strip at all? Not yet. Just finished it this uh, end of summer. You got to be dying to know what it'll turn. I want it. I was waiting for some good weather, but I haven't gotten it. Okay. You have an idea? What are you shooting for? Uh, low tens. Yeah, because it's a nitrous car. It should be able to do it. Yeah. Okay. Now, why? The only thing I would quarrel with, not that I get to quarrel because I don't. The only thing I get to quarrel with is how come an automatic instead of a four-speed? 
Uh, less to deal with, more consistent. Well, no doubt about it. You're going right. to run more consistent, probably even faster, but isn't it more fun with a four-speed? Never had a four-speed car, so. How old are you? 36. Yeah, see, I think the younger guys, <laughs> I, no, I, actually the reason I'm going for that is because most of the younger guys will opt for the uh, automatic transmissions with the superior performance and consistency, you know, whereas guys my age kind of want to feel the car, you know what I mean? Yeah, but that's where you mess up, though. You're not as consistent as an automatic. Oh, no, automatic. not if you're really good. <laughs> it, you have to be very good, and you can't have a bad day. Okay, uh, Chicago gearheads. Uh, not all Chicago policemen. Uh, what basically does the club consist of? Somebody want to speak for you guys? or? Most of them are Chicago police officers. Others are just friends and families of the, you know, the police officers. But there's about 300 members in our club, and we're at every car show, basically. Today we got 36 cars here. The thing I like about it is that for those of you that, that are out there, young guys particularly, that think that the policemen are always against you and all that, no. in all likelihood, they're one of you, right? Oh, yes, yes they're with us. Yeah, yeah, yep. There's no question about it. The, uh, and, they just want everybody to be safe. They want all. everybody to be safe and doing their job to keep everybody safe and, and all that sort of thing, but they're regular guys. Correct. Absolutely. Okay, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us. Janine, broaden your shot, take in a bunch of the gearheads and the car. We've already identified an absolute lie. It's not a 327. <laughs> I sure hope Bill doesn't get stopped by the Chicago police. Some might not get his humor. Now let's check out another of the very important car clubs. Once again, as I keep saying over and over again, uh, these car shows are very heavily dependent on the participation of car clubs, and there are a huge number of car clubs participating here today. This is the North, and I'm not reading it, I'm behind the sign, the North Shore, help me. Yep. North Shore Corvette Club, sponsored by Libertyville Chevrolet. And you guys have been around for a long time because we've had some of you people on before in uh, yep. previous episodes. In fact, I would say you guys have got to be around like 20 years. Yeah, well, we've uh, actually passed 30. 30, 30 years. years. Well, yeah, 1973 was when we started. Well, congratulations. Thank and you. first of all, you are. My name is Tom Arvidsson. And you are the president? I'm the president of North Shore Corvette Club. Okay, what do you guys essentially do? Well, we do, uh, we, we love the car. We love the sport. And uh, we try to uh, kind of do anything uh, having to do with it. So we do racing. We do parades. Uh, we do car shows, we do cruise nights. So in other words, uh, one of the things, and, and for people who aren't enthusiasts, who aren't car enthusiasts, don't understand this, in order to enjoy your cars, you really have to use them. And in order to use them, you need events. Uh, the car clubs are the likely people to put on the events. Yes, there's professional yeah. racing. Yes, you can go and get a NASCAR license and drive NASCAR. Yeah. That's so far out of reach for most people. However, yeah. a club can rent a racetrack yes. and run a little event or, or put on a car show, am I right? That's right. And as, as a matter of fact, in our uh, club, we have uh, uh, people who are amateurs who are just getting into the sport. We have people who have been doing this for years and years. We have professional racers. We have professional drag racers. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of people to, to use as a, as a uh, skill set, you know, to, to learn how to take care of the car and how to use it. Okay, now I am standing in front of, and Janine, if you would just uh, pan over here just a little bit, uh, my new favorite Corvette, and I've had a lot of favorite Corvettes over the years, but how do you not love a new six-speed oh. 427 Corvette? Oh, I'll tell you, this is a beautiful car right here. This is owned by Tom White, and uh, you can see that he has uh, done some custom... Uh, uh, put some accessories on it, some custom wheels, and it's a beautiful car. As a matter of fact, what I liked about this thing, and Jeannie, if you pull your shot back just a little bit, we've got a coupe here, I think it's a coupe, and uh, right behind it, we've got a Roadster, and of course, I always pick the Roadsters. That's right, that's right. Well, you know, you're not able to get the Z06 uh, sport I, package I as, a, as a convertible. I'm hoping they wake but, up. But, uh, well, I don't know. You, you know Here's what I want. You want to hear what I want? Okay. Okay, I'm 63. I don't want the hard Z06 suspension. I don't want to road race it. Uh, I want a roadster, yep. and I want a soft suspension, but I want the 427 engine. Now, yep. what do you think? Are they listening? I don't think they are. I don't think they're going to put a soft top on something that goes that fast. Oh, come on. <laughs> they're not that fast. And, Janine, we got an open shot right now. I want you to go over to the white car over here because, in all likelihood, that may be the most valuable one in your display. I believe it is. It Tell the audience is. what it is. That is a 1963 Z06 big tank. And that has a 36-gallon tank, which is a very rare option. Matter of fact, the split window coupes, and Janine, if you're showing the audience the car, you can see that it's got the split window in the back. The split window coupes have become among the most valuable of all Corvettes, and I think that's particularly interesting, the fact that I lived the period. I graduated from high school in 1961, and the reason they stopped making split, split window coupes is because nobody could see out of them, and they didn't want them. And that's now right. they're the most valuable. Isn't that weird? That's right. That's right. They, uh, they uh, took that split window, that uh, bar right out of the middle, just because people were complaining they couldn't see through the rearview mirror. And now those are the most collectible. That's right. Very, very 
weird. It's strange how car people are. And why I think we've got a shot. If you guys can back up just a little bit. Janine, I want you to go over here right now. Somebody just stood in front of the sign. Go ahead, Janine. Over there. Uh, Windy City Corvettes is also here. There, he just stepped away. We can see the Windy City Corvettes on the black uh, curtain there hanging down from the uh, from the table. Uh, Windy City Corvettes, another very active car club. They're the ones that uh, do the spina bifida thing every year with Bill K, uh, uh, Bill K Chevrolet. So if it's not for the car clubs, we don't have a sport, quite frankly. Right. Agreed? Exactly. Okay, exactly. and I assume you guys get along real good with the Windy City guys? Oh, yes, definitely. They're our friends. Okay, very, very, yeah. two very active Corvette clubs. Anyway, just wanted to stop by here and show you part of the fun of the Chevy Vet Fest shows and all of the car shows for that matter is the car clubs and uh, these are the places to come talk to some of the people uh, any number of kinds of car clubs uh, from American Street Machines our own Janine Lauschat and Art Lauschat uh, to the Windy City Corvettes to the North Shore Corvettes uh, you'll find something that uh, maybe you kind of hook up with and you end up being a member of a car club it's it's really a lot of fun it really is and it's what makes our sport it's true the car clubs offer a place for people with common interests to socialize, but just as important are a valuable source of information and help for someone working on a car project. Now let's check out one of the many race cars on display. Well, here's a guy that might not be lying. He does at least say 427. Uh, I know it's a lot bigger than that, but he's at least admitting to 427, not that 327 stuff. First of all, you are. Carlos Caro from River Grove. From River Grove, and you are, please step forward here, and you are? Steve Schimmelars. From? Uh, Chicago. Okay, whose car? Mine. Tell me about it, what do we got here? Uh, it's got a 400 in there. Uh, well, what, what size is it? 400. What size is it? 565. 555, okay. Boy, you can't get away with that stuff with me. Go ahead now. <laughs> yeah, it was built by uh, J-Lo Racing's Jimmy Lopez. Actually, they got the build engine. I'm very happy with him. Um, Days from Days um, performance transmission. Did the trans and what kind of trans? It's got a uh, power glide. Okay, and it's obviously a drag racing car. Yes, it is. What kind of numbers? It runs low eights on motor. Yeah, we haven't sped it this season, but next year we will. This runs low eights low on eights. motor. Right, on motor. that's correct. On motor. Come on. Seriously. You guys have any slips with you? Uh, no, we don't. Okay, yeah. how do I I probably do. Low eights on motor. Yeah, low eights on motors. Okay, you know that that's pretty startling. On, on nitrous, I understand. Wait a minute, see, folks, I'm making them prove it here. Now, I'm, I'm only kidding. You don't, have to, you don't have to pull it. I'm only teasing. Did you build a car or did you buy it this way? No, we built a car. I actually traded with my friend Jimmy Lopez. Um, traded to the other car I had before. He's been on the show. This is a totally new car that he built for me. Okay, and uh, so you're a drag racer then? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, season uh, over with before you had a chance to try the nitrous. Why didn't you get to the nitrous? Um, actually, the builder said I wasn't ready for it yet. So well, if I you're in low eights, you may not be ready for it ever. Yeah, I got to listen to him, you know. He's the one to build the engine, and he tells me how to run the car. Who drives it? I do. Okay, and did you do any of the work on it? Um, yeah, I did some of the work on it, and so is mine. The basic tune-ups, the basic tune-ups, the setup of the tire, which you call it What part of it do you do? Uh, then which called go over the valves, the heads, the tune up. The so you're kind of an engine guy? Uh, that's pretty much, pretty much. Okay. Anything I haven't noticed about your car that you think the audience would like to know? Nah. Uh, which called from it is uh, auto conversions. Yeah. Did which, which most of the chassis work on the car? Well, if you're running in the A's, what kind of mile per hour? 163. Boy, that is smoking fast. You uh, you blow some nitrous in there, and you're going to be approaching 200 miles an hour. With it. Yeah, that's what I I would like that number to show off. Everybody wants that 200 mile an hour number. Janine, show the audience the car if you would. Uh, really great uh, television color, uh, kind of a bright orange tangerine for a car with over 500 cubic inches running in the eights. Next, Bill found what he likes to find best, pretty girls participating in motorsport. The flames you are looking at uh, were done by a person that we've had on the show before. As a matter of fact, he's the son of a physics teacher who is a physics teacher, but also an alumni of mine from Lane Tech High School from years and years ago. So every time they've got something to show off, I put them on the air. And this is particularly interesting because this car and this car are being displayed by girls. And we've got them right here and you are. Carissa Pasternak. From? Mount Prospect. And? Amy Zizzo. And I'm from Algonquin. Okay, as a matter of fact, if you notice, she's wearing a Firebird shirt, but it's her Camaro. And you're wearing a Camaro shirt, but it's your Firebird. Yes, it is. Let's start with the Firebird. What have you got? Um, it's just a 99 Trans Am. It's my daily driver. I've driven it in the snow. Um, that's about it. 
what would provoke you to put it into a car show? I'm sorry, what was that? What would provoke you to put it in a car show? This one right here. Well, uh, but are you having fun? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, so you're enjoying it. What, what do you like about it? Um, it's fast. No, no, I mean about doing the car show. Oh, I don't know. People, I get to show off my car. Yeah, and you like talking with the people and all that? Yes, I do. Yeah, okay. And how about yourself? Uh, tell me about your car first. Well, it's a 95 Camaro Z28. Um, it's been, you know, worked on by everyone in my family, my father, my brother, myself, and my your, boyfriend. Your father's a physics teacher. Do you know that? Yes, I did know that. So that car should be the fastest car in the world. Right. Yeah. And it is. It's lightning speed. Okay. Well, I'll be the judge of that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and basically, it just it has a, a roll cage in it that was custom built, and it's got a whole bunch of um, billet aluminum pieces that are underneath in the engine compartment. And all the work has been done by myself, my boyfriend, and my family. As a matter of fact, I understand your brother actually did the flames. He did. He did the paintwork on the flames, and he's done the paintwork on my car. Okay, well, it looks great. Now, is there anything you'd like to mention about the car that I haven't thought to ask you about? Um, just now, why do you do the car shows? Does your dad force you to do them? No, not no, at all. You like to do it yourself? I love doing it myself. It's really? a lot of fun. Because and you dragged your girlfriend into it? Yes, I did. <laughs> okay, the reason I'm asking these questions is because we would like to see more female participation. We try as hard, all guys try hard to encourage women to participate and all that. And I'm wondering what magic words you had that did it. Um, basically, that it's a lot of fun and like we were able to do it together and we talk to each other and give each other advice for everything. Okay, so you're a car person? Yes, I am. Okay, well listen, anything I haven't mentioned about your car or didn't think to mention that you'd like the audience to know? Um, just that it's a daily driver and it's in great condition and I take it to the track. And she's going to win first place. Uh, oh, yeah. You've had it to the drag strip? Yes, I have. What kind of numbers? Uh, that's classified information. <laughs> Come on, what kind of numbers? 13.5 and a quarter mile. Okay, well that's not terrible. Not horrible. Oh, not at all. So are you going to pursue that? Are you going to try to go faster? Yes. Some nitrous, something? No, no, no. You don't want to go that fast? No. Well, listen, girls, thanks for spending a little time. With As a matter of fact, Janine, I want you to come in and frame these two up. If you guys would stand close together like that, I want you to frame these two up, Janine, because this is what we want to do is we want to encourage more female participation. Actually, I'm surprised more girls and women don't participate. Patty and I both show our cars and always enjoy it. And for you single girls, it's also a great place to meet guys. Now, let's see what Bill found next. Well, of course, you know a supercharger is always going to get, grab my attention, especially these big GMC blowers. I know that the, uh, the hot tip and all the enthusiasm now is for the little turbochargers, and clearly they have a lot to uh, speak of. But there's nothing like the appearance of the big GMC-style blowers, or for that matter, the sound that they make. Pretty awesome. And, Janine, as you pull your camera shot back, you can see we've got it attached to a great car, and you are? Thank you. Jason Eberhardt. And where are you from? Uh, Elgin, Illinois. Tell us about your car. Start with the make, year, and model, please. Uh, this is a 78 Camaro Z28. Uh, I've had it since I was 15 years old. So really? So this is my first car. And I've, what are you, about 17, 18 now? Uh, sure, sure. <laughs> no, I've had it about 18 years. Wow. Uh, I used to drive it every day to high school. So you're one of those, you're not going to be one of those guys like me that wishes I had all those cars that I had. You're going to be the guy that kept I, your car. I hope so, yes. Okay, and uh, obviously it wasn't like this when you bought it. No, actually we found it from the original owner. Uh, in, well, you didn't buy it, no. No, uh, in Cary, Illinois. Uh, it was a one-owner car. It only had 23,000 miles on it when we bought it. Uh, I was 15 years old and just had to have it, and uh, it needed a little bit of work, but, you know, we took care of it, and I drove it every day for okay. several years. <laughs> and somewhere along the line, you got crazy. A little bit, yeah. Uh, my dad's an old drag racer, so uh, he kind of influenced me, and this is about the third engine we've had in the car. And Tell us about it. What uh, do we got? It's a 350 Chevy. It's 30 over, uh, 671 blower, twin 600 carburetors, uh, eight and a half to one pistons, competition cam, aluminum heads. The works. Yeah, obvious question. Uh, well, first of all, numbers. Uh, it's about 700 horsepower, just under that at the crank. At the drag strip. Uh, we have not raced it with you this. You gotta be kidding. Not yet. Not with this setup. Uh, this is a little too much power for the chassis setup right now. Uh, it's going to get a new rear end this winter and uh, some bigger tires and a little bit of traction, and we'll okay. see what she'll do. Okay. Question's obvious. We've explained on Motorsports Unlimited many times. There's really only three ways to make an engine make more power. You can either make it bigger, rev it higher, or force the air in. You selected forcing the air in. Absolutely. And, but the question would be, why not first start out with the biggest engine possible and then force it in? I actually already had this engine, uh, and it's a 354 bolt, uh, steel crank, pink rods, the bottom the end parts. was already okay. there. Okay. Uh, all we did was change the pistons, the cam, and bolted the blower right to it. 
Okay, let me give the audience a little bit of an idea of what you're talking about there. When he's talking about it, he had the good crank and the good rods. Uh, there's a variety of ways to make parts when you're making pieces. When the factory first produces these things for mass consumption, they'll have a cast crank and cast rods. None of it particularly strong, but adequate for the 200 horsepower the engine's going to make. When you start making big horsepower out of these things, none of those parts will hold up. And you have to go to things like a steel crank. And we say steel crank, it's a high quality. Is it a forged yes, crank? Yes, it is. Or, okay. forged. In this case, a forged crank, one of the strongest ways to make a part. And of course, forged rods. Oh, absolutely. Forged rods. So he had all of those good pieces. That gave him the ability to go ahead and bolt the blower on and yep. not blow the pieces out the bottom. That's right. <laughs> okay, but no desire to put in a 600 inch motor or something and then uh, supercharge. Not in this car, it. no. Uh, I, I had the desire, just not the pocketbook to do it. <laughs> okay, and why did you build it? If you haven't been to the drag strip with it yet, I, that puzzles me because this I looks like been, a drag race car. I had been when it was just a single carbureted small block. Uh, that was a little bit of fun. I took it to the track and had some fun with it. And then when we got crazy with the engine, I started breaking parts. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, the transmission, it's a four-speed car. If I'm going to start seriously racing it, I'd probably put an automatic in it uh, with oh. a trans brake and a few other toys. Ah. Well, I've broke this trans three times. I know. I know. <laughs> Just but playing more, around But it's more fun street. to drive in a street. Absolutely. Uh, I love having a four-speed car. You bet. And, uh, like I said, I broke it three times playing around. So <laughs> take it to the track. Uh, I don't know if this is the right trans for this car. It's definitely not the right rear end. It needs a little bit taller gear and uh, probably a little bit bigger axles. <laughs> well, is there anything that I haven't noticed about your car that you think the audience would be interested in knowing? Uh, the interior, we just finished it uh, right before this show with uh, new seats. Uh, we wrapped the cage, the door panels. A good friend of ours did it and he did a fantastic job. Well, it's a great car. Janine, I want you to pull the camera shot back, show the audience the car. Uh, what we are looking here is my kind of Camaro, supercharged, four-speed. I love it. Now that's my kind of car. I have a 1990 Camaro RS. Let's check out Janine's kind of car. This car I picked because of our own Janine Lauschott. Janine Lauschott has the world's most perfect Monte Carlo, a 1986 Monte Carlo that she bought brand new and has been kept in a heated air-conditioned garage ever since. It has the original air in the tires, the original battery, the original everything. This one looks like it's had a little bit of work done to it. First of all, you are. I'm Scott Lee. Where are you from, Scott? Lombard. Tell us about your car, please. Uh, it's a 74 Monte Carlos. It's got the factory original big block, 454. This is a big block car. Big block car. Yep, factory. Yep, it's got the factory sunroof. Um, all the options that 74 had, uh, it's got. So. Did you get it this way or did you have to uh, fix it? Um, I got it from a guy in Montana. Uh, he had it painted. Um, I did some work in the interior, but pretty much, as you see, is, is the way I got it. So. Now, why did you specifically want to, I assume you specifically wanted a Monte Carlo? Oh, yeah. Carlo. Yeah, I mean, these are beautiful cars here, but this is my one and only car. My first car was a 74 Monte Carlo. So you have a particular, what, the style appeals to you? Yeah, the style, the ride. I mean, it's a comfortable ride. You can get in it and drive anywhere you want. It's just a smooth ride, you know, for 74. So it's just a great car. Okay, yeah, I'm just puzzled because there's lots of great rides in 74. I'm wondering what about the Monte Carlo appeals to you so much? Well, like I say, my first car I ever had was a 74 Monte Carlo, and it just takes me back. You know, it's just, I, I ride in this car, I think of, I was 16 years old again, you know. So you're reaching back, kind of. Reaching back, yeah. Did yeah. it work? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm always 16 when I'm driving the car. It, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, I like it, yeah. Okay, is there anything we haven't talked about on your car that you'd like the audience to know? Uh, no, just like I say, it, it's got all the factory original or well, factory original engine, drivetrain, and all that. Yeah, the fact it's got a big block, that's impressive. Yeah, I don't know. People say there's 1% to 2% of them with the big block. I don't know that for sure, but I'm just kind of taking it. Very down. rare, believe me. Very rare, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Janine, show the audience the car because this one I did because of you, and I want the audience to see why I did it because Janine has the other perfect Monte Carlo. I love Monte Carlos, but just as important as the cars, is the stories they carry with them, like this one. Yes, this is a very impressive, cowl-inducted, big block Chevelle. But really, that's a minor part of the story. As Janine pulls her camera shot back, you can see we've got a great red Chevelle. First of all, you are. I'm Joe Staff from Huntley, Illinois. Uh, tell us about your car. Why don't you start with the make, mirror, and model before we get to the story. You bet. It's a 1970 Chevelle SS 396. It's an L34 block with uh, the three, 350 horsepower. Okay, so we got a big block uh, Chevelle with cowl induction and all that. 
the interesting part of it is how you found it and how you got it. What yeah, happened? It's a pretty interesting story. About four years ago, a friend of mine informed me that the, this car was sitting in a garage in a guy's back barn. So we drove over there, looked at it. It had about nine years of accumulated debris on the car. Just sitting there? Just sitting there in his garage, right. We, we took the three of us probably about uh, two hours to get all the junk away from the car, revealing what you see right here. It was uh, in great shape, great not shape, dented, nothing? Not dented, nothing. Uh, the paint was in good shape. We had a wet sand it to bring the luster back out, but it ran. We actually started it. We trailered it back home. I had to rebuild most of the seals that leaked, the carburetor leak, um, engine leak, trans leak, rear end leak. So probably after about two weeks of working on it, we got her up and running, but it's, what was the story? Why was it sitting for almost 10 years unused? The guy loved the car. It was his baby. He only drove it once a year. And then uh, he just did not have a lot of money. He stored it, uh, started it occasionally, but never drove the car. Uh, he was moving back to Kentucky. It's an original Kentucky car. He was moving back to Kentucky. In fact, when we bought the car, we picked it up on a Monday. He was back in Kentucky on Wednesday. He'd sold his house, all of his belongings. This is the last thing he had. He needed the money to get back home. Now, I assume, being an honorable man and you knowing what this thing was worth, I am assuming that you gave him far more than he asked for it, right? Well, I didn't even know what the car was or what it was worth when I bought it. Now you're backpedaling. It. No, I'm telling you. I didn't know what it was at the time. I just bought it for uh, a race car. I was going to make a race but car. But now that it. you know, you went and found him and gave him some more money, right? Uh, if I could find him, I would say thank you, but I wouldn't <laughs> give him any money, no. <laughs> I'm only just teasing. The point is, it's still possible. Yeah. It's still possible to find a car in a barn. Yes, it's still possible. I can attest to that. Right. The one, the best story we've heard on Motorsports Unlimited is somebody found an antique car, I believe, in a garage in Evanston, where they had actually built an extra wall in the garage, walled the car off 30 years before, wow. and when they started taking the wall down, they found a car behind it. It's still possible. It's still possible. It's still very possible. Well, it's pretty cool. Anything that you haven't mentioned about the car that you'd like the audience to know? Well, the car has got originally, when I bought it, it was 26,000 miles. I put about 4,000 miles. It just clocked over 30,000 miles, original miles, and it drives like it's 1970. It's a pleasure to drive the car. So you're actually using it? I love the car, yes. I think that's great. Now, by the way, are you enjoying the show today? I am. It's a very good show. Okay, first time at Chevy Beth Fest? No, I'm a regular member here. You're a regular yeah, guy. Yeah, regular. Okay, well, look, even, a, even a regular guy. Do you like the new location? I do. Yeah, I think this works out well, and it's easier to get to. I, I agree. Okay, and for the swap meet, guys, it's really convenient out the back door. It is. Anyhow, what I'm talking about, folks, when I talk about the swap meet thing is the Chevy Vet Fest shows are always car shows and swap meets. And for people buying parts and stuff like that at McCormick Place, it's a little bit different to get to the place where you can get the stuff out of the building and all that. And here it's real easy. You can pull right That's up to the building correct. and get the stuff. So I, I think it's good. They got one here and one at McCormick Place. And uh, I, you know what? We're running out of time. Let's see if we can get uh, another car on. Of course, at any show involving Chevys, longtime friend of Motorsports Unlimited and Chevy expert John Pultania will be found. When Bill bumped into him, he asked John, which car do you think is the most special in the entire show? Don't let me miss it. He took Bill to this one. When I come to the Chevy Vet Fest, one of the things that I try to do is get a hold of my old friend, John Platania. We've identified on the show many times that John Platania is our Chevy expert. Chevelles, Camaros, Corvettes, things like that. He's restored a bunch of them. He's got a Yanko Camaro and all the rest of it. And I always grab my old friend, John, and Janine, if you can come over here with the camera shot, please. I always grab my old friend, John, something like this. John, come on over here. John, what's special at the show here that I'm going to miss because you're the Chevy expert and you said what? That this is the most special Z01 or probably 69 Camaro out there. Maybe the most special Chevy. It's, it's in that category, yes. First of all, you are? Dave Christian Holtz. Where are you from, Dave? I live in Arizona, Paradise Valley, originally oh. from Morton Grove. Really? Yep. Okay, and you left us? Yep. <laughs> 23 years ago, 24 years ago. Okay, tell us about your car. What have we got here? Well, it's one of 69 ZL1s. Um, the, what makes it special is the aluminum motor, full aluminum block, full aluminum heads. Um, it's uh, very special because it's got a rally sport option and it's in original condition, original paint, original interior. Uh, most of it's all original, original motor, original transmission. Fair to say for survivor car. Very much so. Okay, John, you grabbed me right away. You went through very much the same thing that he said, and I says to you, because I looked at it, now you will forgive me. Normally, if we look at a Camaro, we're going to see a very expensive Camaro. It's going to be brilliant red or yellow or something. It's not going to have a white vinyl roof and little tiny hubcaps and all that sort of thing. And I said to John, 
as he's telling me about this very special, and of course I'm aware that the aluminum black thing, and I says, yeah, John, it's that special. He's Bill, easy $2 million car. How come? <laughs> Because it's so original. I mean, if you want a Z01, if a collector wants a Z01, which Dave is a big collector, but this is the Z01 to own. This and this is the one you want. And there's only one. And this would be one that would bring if, for our regular viewers. I'm sure watch a lot of Barrett Jackson and all that. This would be the one that would bring the big numbers. Yes. And. Who knows what the big numbers are? Well, really we don't know because we it, don't know. anything just, is only right. worth what people will pay for. And exactly. that varies from time to time, and I understand yeah. all that. But when you said that, I took another look. I says, boy, I don't know, a couple million dollars. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, and, but it's because yeah. of what it is. Yeah, the motor option alone was $4,160 on a base car that was $2,700. That kind of puts it in perspective. That's uh, why they didn't sell very many of them, because the motor option was so overpriced. Absolutely, and in fact, that's why this car has the stripes on it. All the others are basically sleeper cars. They, the, the dealership couldn't sell it, so he, he had to stripe it and figure out some way to, to sell it, maybe make it look like one of those Yanko things. So that's what he was just trying to jazz it up a little bit to make it look. And now here we stand. How many years later? I'm not doing my math quickly. How many years ago was this thing made? Oh, about 37. Huh? 37. 37 years ago. And slide this thing out in Barrett Jackson and everybody goes nuts. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that this no, year. It sounds to me like you're going to hold on to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, listen, it's a great car, and I thank you for sharing it with us. And once again, this is the guy, John Platani, that we depend on. When I want to find something, I will, I will confess to you. I just walking past it, I probably would have walked right past it had John not attract, told me what was so special about it. And I think you know what I mean, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Thank you, John. Well, Bill, all weekend I watch people walking by this car. And it's just a shame because they don't get it. They don't know where they're walking by. You know, you really have to know the car or do a little. Because the car has been in collections all the time. So no one really knows the car. So well, not only that, car, the car thing is very much like wine and like art. You have to have a very sophisticated palate to enjoy fine wine. You have to have a very sophisticated eye to enjoy fine art. And it's really the same thing with the car thing. It's not just, you know, the one that's going to attract the attention of the average person is the jukebox. But, but to something really, it takes a sophisticated palate. You know what I mean? And, oh, and, and yeah. John's the guy that's got that palate, and that's why I rely on my friend. Janine, show the audience the car. Very, very special, probably the most valuable car in the show today. And if you were here and you walked right by it, shame on you. When John Platania says it's valued in the area of $2 million, you can take it to the bank. He's pretty close. John knows his stuff. Now with time running out, let's see if we can squeeze in one more car. You are looking at the engine and engine compartment of one of the most tastefully done, exquisite cars that I have ever seen. As Janine pulls her camera shot back, I hope you will be as seduced by this car as I am. As a matter of fact, we're going to be going out on this piece, so if we end abruptly, it's my fault. I want to talk to this fellow a little bit, and first of all, you are. Chuck Romani. And where are you from, Chuck? Silvis, Illinois. Is that in America? Yeah, it's right on the borderline of Iowa and Illinois, oh, up so in the Quad Cities area. So you came a long way? About three-hour drive. Okay, do you normally come to Chevy Vet Fest? Or? I used to come all the time, but this is the first time with a vehicle. Well, this is an incredible place. I want you to describe to the audience and start with the make, year, and model, please. It's a 66 Chevelle, uh, Super Sport. Uh, we put in a 454 motor, board 30 over. It's approximately 4089 cubic inch. We've got Brodex heads. They've been ported and polished along with the intake to match. Uh, it puts out approximately 800 horse. And what about transmission? The transmission is stock. It's a Richmond T10, four-speed. So we got a four-speed car. That's because you're about my age, and we want four-speed cars. That is correct. You're, now, do you you don't actually use the car, do you? Yeah, I, I drive it occasionally. It's too low right now. This uh, off-season, we're going to put an air ride system on it to make it a little bit user-friendly. I cannot help but notice the paint. It's the thing that struck me. And Janine, I don't know if you can find someplace on the car where you can come in and contrast the sort of bronze color with the burgundy and the lighter burgundy stripe with the pinstriping separating it. Uh, see if you can get something close there, Janine, so the audience can see what I'm talking about. What a tasteful look. Who put those colors together? My wife. Boy, she is to be congratulated. I've never seen one quite like that. It's beautiful. Well, the top is chestnut, and that comes off to about a 2000 Ford pickup color. The bottom half is what they call fusion orange. That's the brand new Pontiac color, GM color. The 3-8 split is what they call hot pepper red pearl, and that came off a Honda. 
I'll, I'll tell you something that's very, very striking. And we went, before we went on, we started talking, and you said one of the things that you're really proud of on this car is that so many of your friends have been, I kind of assumed that this was a car you had, you contracted to have it built by a professional builder, but apparently not the case. No, all my friends, I, I, I can't give them enough credit. If it wasn't for them, the car wouldn't have got done. Okay, so you were involved with this thing from every step of the way and then involve your friends in their area of expertise, like you said your son is an engine builder and all that? Well, my brother-in-law is the brother engine builder. I'm sorry. Yeah, my brother-in-law is the engine builder, and he, he built the whole thing for me. He's kind of into drag racing, so he knows quite a bit about motors. My nephew uh, put in the stereo system. Uh, Big River Custom, I got uh, three good friends out there. They're the ones that did the whole body work. Uh, Glenn Winters is a real good friend of mine from John Deere. He did all the electrical and a lot of the machining. Uh, Glenn uh, is skilled in machining also. Uh, let's see, Dallas Hoffman, Russ Hoffman, Bob King let me use his garage with a hoist so we could do things underneath the car. And Rick Hickson is another good friend of mine. He did the rear end work on this car because he drag races also. And then Pat Turner fabricated all the inner fenders. The dash is custom built by Pat along with the console. The work is absolutely exceptional, and it's kind of cool that you got together with all your friends to do it. I've got to ask you a question about the speaker system. Again, you look about It sure my looks age. like the new location at Donald E. Stevens Convention Center worked out extremely well for the fall edition of Chevy Vet Fest. Unfortunately, we're out of time with only enough left to acknowledge the fine work of our award-winning production team, including Tom McGrady, Rena Borwitz, our webmaster, Frank Barbalace, and Sue Cassanda. Special thanks to JBTV's Jerry Bryant. Music is created for us by independent artist Roger Polly and Jerry Herbert. Of course, we have to take a moment to thank the stars of this edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Patty Borwitz. Janine Lauschott and our host, Bill Wilt. Me, I'm Samantha Bentley, reminding you not to miss any of the three car shows in the Chicagoland area each winter. Remember, there are only three. World of Wheels is next. Thanks for watching. See you next week. This program, made possible in part by support from PB Food Products, located on 47th Street at Western Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from J.C. Whitney & Company, located just off I-80 at the Utica exit in LaSalle, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from Jimmy's Red Hots, located on Grand Avenue and Pulaski Road in Chicago. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from the Chicagoland Toys for Tots Motorcycle Parade held on Western Avenue in Chicago the first Sunday in December. This program made possible in part by support from ABC Auto Parts located on Ashland Avenue at 138th Street in Blue Island, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from Bridgestone Firestone and your local Bridgestone Firestone tire retailers. This program made possible in part by support from Copy That, located in the County Farm Plaza at County Farm Road and Army Trail Road in Carroll Stream, Illinois. Motorsports Unlimited was created to raise public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. You can contact us by email at msutv.com or you can write to Motorsport, P.O. Box 66242, Chicago, Illinois, 60666. We enjoy hearing from our audience. Please let us know what you think. Next week on Motorsports Unlimited, it's our annual Thanksgiving morning pilgrimage to The Rock. The Rock, the place where motorsport began in America Thanksgiving Day, 1895. Join us as we chat with those who drop by to acknowledge the day, like World of Wheels chairman John Langston, the Chicagoland MG Club, and of course, representatives from the Chicagoland Toys for Tots Motorcycle Parade, and many, many more, all next week on Motorsports Unlimited. 
So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So I'll uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And uh, keep on rocking.